watching Michael Jordan, modern day Michael Jordan, in this documentary, um, brings up some questions. I've done some long form pieces for E60, for Outside the Lines. I've done some of these interviews that you sit down for like, in our cases, an hour or two, and then condense down into 10 minutes once it's on air. You've got 10 parts, 10 hours. First, how long did you sit and interview Michael Jordan over several settings for this documentary? It was three separate interviews that took place in June 2018, May 2019. In fact, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of our second interview with him when he's in that maroon shirt. And then December 2019. There's three separate interviews and a total of eight hours that we interviewed him. How was it sitting down with Michael Jordan for eight hours over well, it's almost a two-year period um, where you're talking to him? I mean, we see all the intensity he approaches practice and teammates with. You're sitting down to interview him, and you have to challenge a subject. Uh, you got to follow up. You can't be deferential. How is it interviewing Michael Jordan over eight hours? Um, fun. I, I, I hate to, <laughs> I hate to use such a simple word for it, but honestly, it, it's it's a dream job. You know, these are some of some of them are questions that I wanted to ask as a 43 year old filmmaker, and we want to be sure that that we check all the boxes of a responsible documentary and and um, tackle all the subjects that that people want us to tackle. Uh, and then some are questions that I frankly just wanted to ask since I was nine years old <laughs> about certain games and and certain moments in his career. So. Um, it's, it's definitely a challenge, but I say that in a positive way. It's a challenge to, to keep him occupied. As you said, you have to, you have to um, you know, ask follow-ups and do all the things that a normal interviewer would do, but he's been asked every single possible question that he could be asked. I mean, he's been doing this for, for over 30 years now, 35 years he's been, been sitting down for these interviews. So to, to try and find a way to keep him occupied, to keep his attention, to, to keep him stimulated and engaged – that was as, as fun a challenge as um, anything else. And then, you know, it's years of research that go into sitting down with him, and it's urgent. It, it's, you know, the equivalent for him would, would be like, this, this is my NBA finals because we don't you, – you can't be off your game and have access to a guy like that. We have limited access to him. He was only contracted, actually, for two interviews, and he gave us a third. Um, but if he comes in on that first day and I'm not on my game – and he leaves and we haven't gotten what we need out of him or he just wasn't engaged and wasn't locked in, the documentary is going to suffer greatly for it. So we got very, very lucky in a lot of ways that we had everything down to the right weather. So however he played golf earlier that day, he just he came in a good mood and he came uh, ready to, to be engaged with us. And then um, just it's a matter of preparation and relying on everyone on my team to be sure that, that I go in there as prep as I can. And you did all the interviews, all eight hours with Michael Jordan. Was that you asking the questions? It is. And so the biggest challenge, and I know you just said this, but I want to clarify, I find the process fascinating. The biggest challenge is keeping him engaged. Like he said, oh, I've answered this question 10 times throughout my career, 100 times, thousands of times throughout my career. How do I do it in a new or fresh way? Or was it, I would think intimidation would play a big role as well. Like how much can I press him? Is he kind of staring at me in a way that says shut this down? Or probably even saying at times, shut this down, I don't want to go down this road. He never did that. He certainly never said we couldn't discuss any topics. He was, he was willing to play, and I, I think that's part of the challenge for him and the game for him is that he knows that, that certain people probably aren't expecting him to go certain places, and he's willing to go wherever you want to go. Um, he only shut down once and asked for a break, and that was because he got emotional uh, after a certain question that I asked him, and you'll see that in Episode 7 next week. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it, it, it's not just – asking questions in a fresh way that he's already been asked before. It's just natural human nature to sit there and talk to anybody for three hours. You're going to start to drift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and, and I had to kind of sense, you know, keep with the game plan that I had, because there's certain things that we needed to get out of every single interview in order for us to go back and edit these episodes. You know, my editors are waiting for content. So I have to bring that back to them and say, okay, we discussed the 89 Cavalier series here. So we can, we can start editing that scene. We discussed the 91 finals against the Lakers here. We can start doing that. So we had to really be buttoned up with exactly what our goals were going in. And you don't just go in there and sit there and have a conversation and hope that it's going to work within the 10 hours. It's, it's very, very structured and tactical. But at the same time, you're trying to keep him occupied and keep him engaged. So that's where that iPad 
um, came into play was handing him that because that was almost a toy that I could pull out if I saw him starting to drift or his voice started to get a little bit lower and his energy started to, to lapse a little bit. I could pull that out and not even tell him what he was about to watch. And it was kind of a game for him. So anything with a game for Michael is going to be, is going to get uh, more out of, out of uh, a non-game scenario. So just trying to keep it fun for him and trying to keep it different and engaging the whole time. Oh, I love the tool of the iPad. I was going to bring that up without you even mentioning it just now because that's where you seem to get a lot of authenticity out of him, natural kid-like reaction. Um, when it came to talking about Gary Payton, like the mm -hmm. laughter and then the dismissiveness and then the grudge with Isaiah Thomas, you can show me whatever you're going to show me. It doesn't matter. I'm not going mm -hmm. to change my opinion. I mean, I love the tool of it because it, it, seemed to, it seemed to push him towards, and I'm not suggesting it wasn't authentic in other places, but it seemed unfiltered in those moments. Um, and that seems to be something, though, you didn't really have to, and I don't, I'm not trying to put myself in your shoes or say what was easy or what was hard, but it, it's, and everybody's talking about this week, he, he seems to hold on to grudges. He seems to hold on to those sentiments. I mean, he talked about hating Isaiah Thomas in the present tense, not in the past tense. Um, and that always seems fresh when you're talking to him. Uh, true, but you're st you're still going to get a more visceral, honest response out of him if you actually show him whether whether it's Isaiah's face and voice or Gary Payton's or Reggie Miller's or Dolores Jordan's, his mother's. He doesn't know me, so me sitting there and just reading a paragraph that someone has told me from a transcript of an earlier interview is not going to have nearly the reaction that if I hand him, if I can do my best to bring this person into the room, um, you know, electronically. Uh, that's going to get a, a much bigger reaction out of him, especially someone who, as you said, you know, still feels uh, the, the, the visceral um, competitiveness when he sees some of these guys' faces. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.